I'm going to try to take a minor stroll today. When I first read this gospel, I was thinking, the first thing that hit my mind was the idea of abundance. The fact that the, uh, the fishermen had this amazing catch of fish, just this amazing amount of fish, and they were willing to leave the fish to take on, uh, take on the journey with Jesus, who was preaching the peace that surpasses all understanding. They moved from one kind of abundance to another type of an abundance. And uh, I was thinking that I think for all of us, as we view our lives in relationship with each other and the world, one of the things we try to kind of sort out as we move forward in time and space is this idea of abundance. Are we living in a life of scarcity or are we living in a life of abundance? Or are we living somewhere in between? But the ability, the ability we have to see life as something that is abundant all around us, we are able then to experience God moving into our lives in a variety of different ways. We redefine the idea of abundance as we take this all in. And that's not to say that's easy. There are times in our lives where it's hard to imagine such abundance. Uh, we may be just suffering from so many things, whether it's health-related or mourning the death of a loved one or some other situation that is making it harder and harder for us to see how much life there is around us. But yet, if we open our hearts and minds and listen, we begin to see life unfold in a different way. One of the reasons I love this story is because it does have something to do with fishing. Uh, you see, when I was a kid, uh, we fished a lot. We did not have much money in my household. My, my dad was on medical disability, and our family lost whatever we had through mental and physical health way back in the day when there wasn't the type of insurance there is today. And so my brother-in-laws and my brother had to help the family out, and I did what little I could as a kid. But one of the things we could do, one of the things my dad could do was still fish. Uh, he needed help, but he could still fish. And so once every other week, I would go fish with my dad. But what I would do the night before, I would uh, go in the kitchen, I would make, uh, take some dry mustard, and some water and some stuff, and I'd mix this mixture up of mustard, and then I'd wander out into the backyard, and I'd get on my hands and knees, and I'd be scraping around for little mounds of dirt, because if I scrape that dirt off, there's a hole. And I'd take the mustard, and I'd pour a little down. And before you know it, worms came out. And I will tell you, I don't know if, what worms feel or don't feel, but when they get a touch of mustard, they seem very angry. They are moving around and I try to catch these worms and put them in this tin uh, uh, pail with that nice moist dirt and I put the, put the worms in, close it up and uh, catch these worms for tomorrow's fish. And then the next morning, my dad and I would drive out to Wall Lake, and he had a little boat out there. He, he uh, had it docked there, an old childhood friend of his, uh, let him keep the boat there, and then uh, we'd fish Wall Lake. Now, I gotta tell you, my dad was no Jesus, but when it came to fishing Wall Lake, he sort of was. He knew that lake like the back of his hand. He knew where the fish were. He knew how to catch them. We just used worms. But when we fished, we just catch panfish, bluegill, crappie, rock bass, sunfish, perch, an occasional smallmouth, once in a while a catfish. We always let those go because they're too hard to clean. We couldn't figure that out but we always had, most of the time, a pretty good catch. Take the fish home, my dad would clean them, he would uh, fillet them, 
and put them in the freezer or give them away to friends, but there was a sense of well-being that we had all this fish. And it was something he could do to provide not only for the family, we ate, we ate fish two to three days a week, and also to give fish to friends. But in that simple aspect of life, there was this profound sense of uh, abundance and gratitude. And it was just something that uh, was special. And now I look at this, this uh, lesson today. Again, it has a lot to do with fishing, to be sure. Jesus is on Lake Gennesaret, which is the same thing as the Sea of Galilee, same thing. It's called Gennesaret in Luke's gospel because it's in the Greek. Uh, the Hebrew would be Sea of Galilee, but same lake, same water. And Jesus is preaching all around the area. As a matter of fact, the day before, he healed Peter's mother-in-law, or Simon's mother-in-law. But today he's preaching along the shoreline. People are gathering to hear him preach. And the people who are gathered are likely involved in the fishing industry. That was the big business there around the Sea of Galilee at the time of Jesus. They either would be fishers, fishermen, or they would be people who would process fish, salt fish, pickle fish, dry fish, package fish, deliver fish, and on and on and on. But it was a major business, and it's what kept a lot of people alive. And this morning, this morning at the Sea of Galilee, Jesus uh, comes upon a group of fishermen who clearly did not have a good night. All of those who gathered around recognized they did not have a good night, which meant they probably would not have, they would not have a great day. If there's no fish to process, what do you do? And uh, they noticed Jesus pushed out in a boat and he faced them and he preached. He continued to preach the good news, the hope that can be found in the great shalom. He kept preaching and preaching and finally he stopped got out of the boat. You could see he was talking to these uh, fishermen and he wants them to, to cast their nets out into the deep water. And you wonder, it's just a weird time of day to even fish, how could that be? But anyway, they go out into the deep and they drop their nets, they catch fish and a lot of fish, a lot of fish. So many fish and these fishing boats are huge. So many fish that they had to literally bring the fish into the boat and they had to ask another boat to come and rescue them. Two boats, two huge fishing boats are literally loaded with fish about to sink. They're barely staying up. They're rescued. They bring the fish in. And as a matter of fact, so many fish, 62,000 pounds. That's how many fish. Can you imagine? 62,000 pounds. It would be like winning the lotto. It was crazy. 62,000 pounds of fish. You can look it up. I read an article. I didn't actually read the article. There's some scholarly article that engineers and theologians wrote that explained the dimensions of the boat and how this and that and displacement and yada, yada, yada. I just went for the bottom line. 62,000 pounds of fish. And then some economists looked at the same issue. What would 62,000 pounds of fish mean during Jesus' day around the Sea of Galilee? Well, it would mean the equivalent of four years, 25 years each of salary for the average fisherman. Can you imagine? Four salaries for 25 years. It would be like an endowment, practically. It was an amazing thing. They'd never seen anything like it. And so what happens is the people are amazed. Everybody's freaking out. I mean, talk about this guy has good news, but there's even more good news. We've got all this fish. What are we gonna do with it? And then what happens? What ha they notice that the fishermen, they leave the fish behind. They leave it all. It's like they left the lotto. And people are saying, what in the world's going on? And they follow Jesus. 
Jesus looks at the guy, he says, be not afraid. Just leave this behind. There's more where this comes from. We have a whole kingdom to explore. And the guys left. And the people were amazed. They had never seen anything like it. Well, so here's the thing. When we think about abundance, we think about our own lives, and, and, and we try to make sense of this world, of our own lives, and our faith, and our relationship with God, and with each other, and with the world around us, it, it almost has to be met with the idea of the question, what can I do? What can I do, Lord? And we need to explore our lives and begin to understand with more certainty exactly who we are, what we are, the blessings that we have, and the opportunities that are all around us to give and receive blessings that go beyond the bounds of the normal imagination. All of this is possible. But to go there, we have to hear the words of Jesus first. Fear not, fear not, you can do it. Now there are times, there are times when we just are not in the position to give as much, that life has just come down on us so hard, but it's at that point that we are commissioned to receive, to let God's love come into our hearts and minds through the people in our lives, to call for help, to ask for help, to receive help, to accept help, and to recognize by simply doing that, particularly in this society, you are creating meaning for people that you can't even begin to imagine. Because you see, in our faith, we're meant to give and receive love. We each have a story to tell in this regard. I want to close by telling a short story about a gal named Ellen. She uh, was a parishioner at my former church. Ellen uh, spent her career working in a nursing home. And then she retires from working in the nursing home. And uh, we had started this nursing home ministry. She was certainly some inspiration. I talked to her about it. She didn't participate. But ultimately, what happened with Ellen, she took ill, and she's in her early 80s, and it got to the point where she couldn't live in her own home. So her daughter painfully moved her into a facility where there's uh, nursing care, uh, rehab, uh, a multi-purpose facility. And, and Ellen did have her own room. It was a pretty nice room, actually. It was pretty, pretty okay. But when she got there and she realized she lost her home, she lost her, her cats, she had cats, she couldn't drive anymore, and she got really bitter. It was so hard for Ellen to accept that this is where she's likely to die. And after a few weeks, we had other members of our church coming into this facility, visiting other people, and they'd stop in and say hi to Ellen. After a few weeks, Ellen, uh, well, I guess she sort of snapped out of it. She recognized she knew so much about nursing homes. She knew what it meant to, for people to live in them, for people to work in them. She used her, she got in her wheelchair and she wheeled around the place and she talked to various uh, residents of the nursing home and listen to their stories, but she also talked with the staff and listened to their stories as well because she understood how hard that work was. And over a period of time, the idea of scarcity for Ellen becomes one of abundance. Her life is filled to the brim. 
Well, sadly, she, well, she decided to get an operation and uh, she had some congestive heart failure and other things. And I know I was at her uh, uh, room the last night before she went into surgery and she said, I know I'm taking a chance. It's a 50-50 deal. Either I'm going to have a lot more energy or this will be it. And I'm okay with that. Well, she didn't make it. A couple days later, she died. And uh, the people in the nursing home were so impressed with Ellen, they literally named her room after her. It is from now on Ellen's room. She had touched so many lives. She went from scarcity to abundance. And so, my friends, as we move forward and think about this idea of scarcity and or abundance or a little bit of both, I invite us to take a step back and, and just see the blessings that are in our lives and the opportunities that we have to give and to receive, knowing that all will be well and there is no need to be afraid. Amen.